Hey everybody, it's time for Office Hours with the Professor, the show where I say things. So, as loyal viewers of the show might know, my episodes tend to be a little bit better late than never. So, uh, I think that's kind of the case here, but that's alright. You might be wondering where I've been in the last couple of months. Actually, I did some bike touring in Taiwan and in Laos, both of them wonderful, wonderful places for bike touring, so really cool stuff. And then I came here, where I'm at now, to Thailand, where I'm teaching at a middle school over the summer, so that's kind of cool. Now I don't have my computer, so I don't have any fancy vi video editing, so we're going to do this in one take on my phone. So pardon me if I slip up a couple of times, but we're going to try to get all the way through this without stopping. So let's move on. Last time we talked about uh, Grandpa George and Turconoboy, if you remember. So these guys belong to the Homo ergaster, Homo erectus uh, species of human ancestors. Now, remember, ergaster and erectus, a lot of people are saying they might even just be the same species. Uh, just given names for within Africa, Ergaster, and outside of Africa, Erectus. On the other hand, there are also splitters in the scientific community. So it's really a question of debate. Uh, I'm going to talk about them like they're the same species, just for the sake of argument. So they were the most successful Homo species, and they're attested from almost 2 million years ago to 150 thousand years ago. Okay. Now sometimes you're going to see weird dates here for the most recent one, like 50,000 years ago or even 10,000 years ago I saw once, and those are inaccurate, those are ridiculous. The 50,000 year ago one say, uh, was redated in 2011, and the 10,000 year old one is, is just totally out there. Uh, it comes from people finding uh, the, the skulls of modern humans whose crania were artificially um, modified or deformed for cultural reasons and finding these skulls and saying, hey, it's Homo erectus. It's not. Um, at any rate, the most recent undisputed erectus fossils come from 150, 140,000 years ago and between then and maybe even 500,000 years ago. So it's, even then it's a big gap. 150 to 500,000 years ago from the Solo River site in Indonesia. Now you might be saying, wow, 350,000 year gap. What, what, what a, that's, that's quite large. But think about it like this, okay? So even if it's a conservative estimate, even if Erectus has been uh, extinct for 500,000 years, uh, think about it like this. That would still mean that these guys were around for 1.2 million years. And our species, Homo sapiens, has only been around for a sixth of that time. So it still makes them a lot more successful than us. Especially if things keep going the way they're going with North Korea, right? <laughs> I just, of course. Hopefully. Anyway, Ergaster and Erectus, they not only made it out of Africa, but they spanned the whole of tropical and subtropical Africa, Eurasia, uh, even as far northwest as France and northeast as Beijing. So we do know, however, that they never made it, or as far as we know, they never made it to the Western Hemisphere. Okay, and that suggests to me that they hadn't, quite developed the use of technology that would be needed to survive in a cold climate, since after all, you need to go up here through the Arctic to get to North America, right? So they didn't, therefore, have the controlled, reliable use of fire. They didn't have warm fur clothing, things like that. Um, or at least, again, controlled and reliable use of fire. Uh, now in the south, as I've already mentioned, they made it to Indonesia, Okay, and if they made it to Indonesia, to me at least, it seems like they would have been able to make it further to Australia. There's no reason we shouldn't think that. But Australia has yet to find any Homo remains dating from before the arrival of modern humans 60,000 years ago. Now, as I say, the inability of Erectus to expand its range into the north suggests that they didn't have things like fire or, or the reliable control of fire. It does, however, 
uh, appear that they had the occasional use of fire or occasional access to fire. We have pretty good evidence that fire was controlled in South Africa around a million years ago. And uh, pretty good, again, decent evidence uh, from, from what is now China. We have this fire pit with charred mammal bones that dates back to 1.7 million years ago. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the fire was anthropogenic, of course. I mean, it could, it could be a natural fire that just happens to look like a hearth. But anyway, over the course of Ergaster and Erectus's existence, they did develop much larger uh, brain capacity, okay, or their brain volume. And that has led some experts to suggest that easily digestible cooked meat was available, which could have contributed to this expanding brain capacity. The excellent PBS Nova documentary, Becoming Human, it talks, check it out, it's really good. It talks about how fire and cooking uh, might have actually led Ergaster and Erectus to become more social. For example, by sharing fires for cooking and warmth, right? Now, at any rate, fire use would have been a very gradual process. So perhaps it could have begun with the discovery of embers in the wake of wildfires. And, and maybe they could have carried these embers around and maintained over a long period of time. You know, uh, uh, if you'll allow my imagination to step in, we, we might even say that there's there are deep, deep psychological memories of a fire carrying past deep within our psyche. Again, very fanciful, I know, but hear me out. Think about the Olympic torch relay and how the, this 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 deep psychological significance of carrying the torch from one person to another or keeping the fire going. Or even the, the Prometheus myth, that could have been a very faint psychological memory of carrying around fire. And now, it also could just be that I really like the movie Quest for Fire, and I, I, I'm starting to have some fun here with my imagination. I don't know. But even recently, indigenous populations in wet climates like uh, Tasmania, Ta Tasmania has a, this wet, cool climate, right? And th the people there preferred to carry coals with them instead of going to the trouble of making new fires wherever they went. Now, they could have made new fires. They, they had the ability, but it was just much easier to carry coals with them than to bother with looking for dried wood and things like this in the cold, wet climate of Tasmania. Finally, uh, it's also very worth mentioning that Ergaster and Erectus could have been the first human ancestors to travel by sea. So let's head back to Indonesia, okay? And, and at this time, Indonesia was, uh, the islands were linked by a land bridge, but there were still a few that were cut off by water, okay? One of these that was still cut off by water was, let's draw it here, the island of Flores, okay? the island of Flores. Now, Flores is a big name in paleoanthropology right now, and, and we're going to get to that later, We, I promise. But right now we're just talking about Erectus, okay? So, 900,000 years ago. Let's write that down. 900, yeah, right? 900,000 years ago, we have Erectus remains from Flores, and, and, and they couldn't have gotten there if they had not found some way to get over the water. Now, it could have been that maybe they, they were swept out to sea and they held onto a log or something like that, but could that really have been a large enough population for them to be settled there? I don't know, maybe. They, they, what, seems, what seems most uh, logical, or what seems most the simplest explanation to me, is that they had some sort of primitive raft and they went with it from an, one island to another within sight distance and they could have gotten across these simple channels on some sort of primitive sea craft. Well, at, at any rate, they made it to the island of Flores and even there they were able to discover they were not alone. But we'll get to that later. So, I promise. As far as the Ergaster and Erectus toolkit is concerned, let's take a look at that. 
So, the Ergaster and Erectus toolkit is marked by a particular uh, archaeological industry that we refer to as the Acheulean. Okay, the Acheulean industry, which matches up pretty well with the Erectus timeline from 1.8 million years ago. Okay, to about 100,000 years ago. Okay, so 1.8 million to 100,000 years ago. So, again, a pretty good match. And the Acheulean industry, all right, is, is preceded, of course, remember, by the one uh, more associated with Homo habilis, that is the Olduin industry. Okay, and remember how we remember this, right? The old one is older, right? So, anyway, the Acheulean industry is, is quite marked in its difference from old one, okay? And we, we have this, this beautiful tradition of what we call hand axes from the Acheulean uh, tradition. Hand axes. And Acheulean hand axes, we have... In, in this, this mind-bogglingly long span, it's the same tradition continued over 1.7 million years. How cool is that? I think that's amazing. So, you know, talk about, talk about um, uh, traditions being passed on from generation to generation. This one was passed on for 1.7 million years. That's amazing. So, the, these, these hand axes, and it sounds like a weapon in D&D &D or something. It, it's not. It's like this, this rock. This, let's try to draw one. It's this tear-shaped, kind of uh, chipped off from, from flint, the, these tear-shaped rock, uh, almost knives, that you would hold in your hand and use as a scraping or a cutting tool. Okay? Maybe you can get a little bit of edge here. There we go. Yeah. Happy little hand axe. Ah, okay. So, anyway, uh, Google this. Uh, Acheulean hand axe, then you can actually see a photo. Remember, I'm using my phone, so I can't put a photo in here. So, anyway, uh, the... Now, I'm no flint napper. <laughs> got my notes. The Ashul I'm no flint napper, but the Acheulean hand axes, I, I think, differ from the Olduin tools in their symmetry, and this is important to note, Okay. To me, this suggests greater planning ability. Uh, these tools were made with an end result in mind instead of just banging a rock together and look, finding out what you get. Uh, but, uh, and also unlike Olduin tools, Acheulean hand axes were sourced from higher quality material at some distance from where they were found. So that means that whoever made them uh, probably invested more time and effort into their creation and then carried the hand axe with them when they left. So that's important. They were kept for some time. Now, you might roll your eyes when, when I say that this is beautiful, but I, I really think it is. And looking at these beautiful tools, I can't help but wonder if there was some sort of aesthetic uh, element to their creation. Surely their symmetry and their ease of handling was practically useful, yes, but maybe it just felt right, felt nice to have a nice symmetrical tool. There must have been something more. This, this moreness becomes most evident when we compare these artifacts, as I say, with the earlier Olduin tools. Now, could it be that the Acheulean hand axe was a catalyst for the birth of human aesthetic sensibility as we know it? Could we be witnessing with Acheulean hand axes the birth of art? It seems to me that that's possible. If indeed the Acheulean flint nappers had some primitive aesthetic sensibility beyond the mere utility of their artifacts, that is a big jump forward and in a way the birth of human consciousness itself. Abstract imagination, of course, is what sets us apart from the animals in a way that nothing else does. From these tools, we can already see that Ergaster and Erectus are able to sit down with this rock, okay? And they visualize a hand axe. Imagine the little thought bubble. They visualize a hand axe, and then they turn that visualization into a reality. Now, that's powerful stuff. And... 
very, almost at a very visceral gut level. It could have been almost traumatizing in its immensity. I mean, imagine, okay? Imagine, you have this picture in your mind. And at this time, neither the concept of a picture nor the concept of a mind existed, right? And, and it's only there is potential. But then you realize that potential into a physical reality. Now, I'm no philosopher, as you can probably tell, but wow! I mean, imagine experiencing that and trying to work through it as a collective culture over thousands of generations. And generation by generation, more and more individuals within the culture being able to do this. That's, that's, that's pretty cool, I think. Take from that what you will. Anyway, toward the end of Erectus' tenure and toward the end of the Acheulean period, okay, we are starting to see some tantalizing glimpses of what may have been true art. Well, not really true art, but at least some sort of abstract imagining in the proper sense. Okay, so let's go back again to Indonesia. Indonesia is a great place to talk about Erectus remains. So, Indonesia at the Trinil site, okay? Trinil. And with Trinil, we're looking at probably 500, yeah, right? 500,000 years ago. Okay, and at the Trinil site, we find this amazing, this beautiful zigzag pattern carved onto a seashell. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's astonishing, really. I'm going to try to draw the seashell, so please be patient with me. All right, here we go. There's this one. So Im Im imagine the shell kind of, it it's... it's um, round ends kind of up like this, okay? So, there we go, right? We're kind of a seashell. And on the shell, we have this. Up, down, up, down. Now, you might roll your eyes at that and say, oh, big deal, some, some caveman scratched this onto a seashell. Well, I think it's quite beautiful. It really is. Just think, this is direct evidence, okay, of symbolic abstraction from 500,000 years ago. That's a pretty big deal. And this really is the birth of art. I'm going to try to fix my line here. That's a little bit better. Okay, this really is the birth of art. Okay, now the question is, was this zigzag absentmindedly scratched onto it? It maybe is, is almost like a doodle, like like remember when you were in, in, in class in in high school and you're doodling in the margins of your textbook. Well, yeah, let's think about it like this, all right? If I'm doodling in the margins of my textbook, that's pencil on paper. That's a lot easier than scratching onto a hard surface, right? But on the other hand, I also kind of doubt that this had, this zigzag had any particular significance by itself. If one of these erectus creatures had looked at it, I, I, I kind of doubt they would have been able to read the zigzags, right? Well, but, so I do think it was somewhere in between, okay? It's, it's, here's what I think happened. Some erectus was processing shellfish at camp one day, taking the meat out, putting the shell away, you know, and, and his task was done and he got bored, all right? Let, let's give him a name. Let's say Lucas was his name, all right? So Lucas is processing shellfish. He gets bored when he's done and he takes a rock and he kind of absentmindedly chips at it and wow, look, a cool little line. And then he scratches some more and he entertains himself in this manner. And then he looks at it and he thinks, wow, cool, what a big deal. First it goes up, then it goes down. Ha! How pleased with himself he must have been, right? And then he took the shell and gave it to his girlfriend as a romantic gesture. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, now, of course, I'm kind of having fun at poor Lucas's expense. But if you think about it, erect by erectus standards, a zigzag doodle on a seashell would have been a pretty big deal. And Lucas was not the only one. We're going to go now to Germany. We're going to go to the Bilzingsleben sites. Okay? So, Bilzingsleben. The Bilzingsleben sites. Okay? Now, before I start with Bilzingsleben, it, the quick word. Bilzingsleben is 370 kya. All right, now that's a little bit difficult 
because if we're going to call this an erectus site, that's saying that erectus was present in Europe much later than what is generally accepted to be the case, okay? Um, it appears to be that in Europe, by 600,000 years ago, Erectus had been phased out by the more modern, uh, we say, Homo heidelbergensis, and don't worry, we'll get to that later. But uh, apparently the professionals are calling this an Erectus site, so I'm going to go ahead and believe them. Either way, Erectus heidelbergensis, I would say that's a technical point that doesn't really need to be argued about right now. Um, 370,000 years ago, okay, at this Biltingsleben site, we have this beautiful um, elephant tibia, okay? And onto the elephant tibia are carved these radial lines. So let's look at it. And again, Google this because I'm not good at drawing. But here's our elephant tibia, okay? And onto the tibia we have these cool lines. All right, and, and they're kind of kind of diagonally radiating out. All right, now these these radial lines, it, it's really cool to look at, and I always honestly, it's almost chilling. I get a chill when I look at these lines because clearly this wasn't just an attempt. They're they're too deliberate. Um, <laughs> only imperial stormtroopers would be so precise. Anyway, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no Jawas made these marks. Sorry. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> They're so deliberately made. They couldn't have been an attempt to, to just scratch the meat off the bone or get to the marrow or something like that. No. These marks were made for their own sake. All right? Now, some people are saying, oh, this is a calendar or a ruler or even a protractor. That's stupid. I, I can't even use a protractor. Right. Well, of course, now I, I, can't, I can't hunt a mammoth either, and Homo erectus was able to do that, but the, just my little joke. I can't even use a protractor. How am I going to believe that Homo erectus had a protractor? Ha ha ha. Anyway, so I, I don't think it was anything advanced like that. I, I think it was more like the Trenail shell. Regardless, the critical fact here is that someone sat down, engraved these lines onto the bone, okay, and then actually, again, this, this abstract picture in your mind of these lines in the bone actually becoming a physical reality. For these early creatures, I think the experience must have been almost mystical. It must have been really cool. I would have loved to see this actually happen. Um, so any of you guys with time machines, let me know. Now, the Biltingsleben finds, okay, and the Trenil finds, I... I do want to impress upon everyone how big of a deal this is. I mean, look at how long ago this is. And, and really, before people were even people, they're having these abstract kind of, kind, of, kind of pictures in their minds that they're turning into reality, okay? This is a huge step. It shows that Erectus would have been much closer to us in behavior than to, say, chimpanzees. A chimpanzee could not do this by itself, okay? But here we have this pre-human creature conceptualizing these geometric patterns and then making it into a reality. A chimpanzee couldn't do that. Homo erectus would have been much, therefore, closer to us in its behavior than to a chimpanzee or to an australopithecine or really even to Homo habilis, probably. Okay. Now, would Erectus have had the cognitive ability to understand the concept of time? I kind of doubt that. Okay. I kind of doubt that since ideas like the concept of time, these very abstract things, they, they must have come around very slowly over thousands and thousands of generations with Herculean mental effort and probably a lot of suffering too. But on the other hand, these creatures did amuse themselves by doodling, which might actually be just as monumental. So, before I move away from the Biltingsleben finds, I would like to mention one other discovery, okay? And it's a cool discovery that may have had to do with increased cognitive ability with Erectus, okay? And with Biltingsleben, we find these skulls, all right, of, of the Erectus individuals. And the skulls have been smashed in. 
Okay. Now the smashing in happens post mortem, shortly post mortem. Okay. So it wasn't some geo ge geometric geological process, maybe some rock coming down over thousands of years. It wasn't that. Okay. They died, and then their skulls were deliberately smashed in. Why? Could it be a primitive funeral ritual? Now, why would you do that? Well, what if you don't want your friend to come back as a zombie? What do you do then? You smash his skull in after he dies, right? Well, of course, now that's quite fanciful and quite out there, but I'm really only half joking, right? So there could have been some sort of ritualistic behavior that went in with smashing these skulls or some sort of superstition, which again shows the symbolic and abstract capability of Erectus and Ergaster or at least late Erectus. So anyway, could these guys talk? That's the last question that I want to talk about today. So all this talk about symbols and abstraction, well, one of the most important uh, uh, symbols that humans have invented is language. Language itself is inherently symbolic. Let's write that down. Language equals symbol, right? Okay, so could Erectus talk? Well, like I say, language is inherently symbolic. If I say the word cat, okay, there's nothing inherently catish about that word, and you wouldn't know what it means unless I initiate you into the language club, unless you too know this language, are, are privy to these secrets, right? And so, so that's one thing to take into consideration. There are also physiological considerations, okay? There's some controversy here. So two parts of the body that most are intimately connected with language are the vertebrae, okay? Which physically have to be able to allow us to make speech sounds in our throat. And there's also the Broca's area, which regulates linguistic production, and this is part of your brain, okay? So let's look at Turconoboy. Turconoboy's vertebrae, would not have allowed him, probably, to make the same sounds that we can. Okay, so that's one thing to think about. On the other hand, let's look at our other major find, Grandpa George. Okay, Grandpa George's vertebrae seem not only to have been more human-like, but he also seems to have had a more human-like Broca's area. So that's interesting. The older find, yes. The younger find, no. So let's write that down. So Demonisi, remember, is the site, right? Demonisi. There could have been some sort of primitive linguistic communication. Excuse me, I lost my chalk. Here we go. Could have been some sort of linguistic communication. But Turkana appears not to have been. So, could it have been different subspecies, or could Turconoboy, remember, he was kind of a sick little dude, so maybe Turconoboy just had some, some sort of disability that would have prohibited him, or kept him from speaking. So that's something to think about. Either way, there's some controversy, all right? Now, um, I do doubt, though, even if Demonisi was, the Demonisi hominids were able to speak, I doubt that they just woke up one day and started making sentences with, like, third conditional or whatever, right? That's, that's not probably how it went down. Um, I do like to think that, that they had gradually developed what we would call words, maybe, maybe very simple nouns for things like, like, like uh, food or, 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 or animal names or, or maybe, maybe words for things like the sun or physical, you know, these physical world items, okay? Or maybe they could have even had, they could have even had names for each other. Maybe if, if my friend really likes to eat berries, I could call him Berry or something like that. I don't know. But... I, I think they could have had these very simple, we would almost say pre-linguistic words, but I don't think they would have had things like go, right? Go is a hard concept. Where are you going? How are you going? Uh, who's going, right? Or, or bad. What happened? Why is this thing bad? They wouldn't have had these, these harder concepts to grasp. But I, I don't see any reason and it, to think that 
they couldn't have had these really simple, very practical nouns and names for things. But I'm also not a neurolinguist. That's way beyond me, so don't ask me. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. I am not a neurolinguist, and neurolinguists know more about this. So anyway, that's my whirlwind overview of Homo ergaster and Homo erectus. Tell me what you think. These are some very fanciful imaginings about their behavior and stuff like that. So uh, let, let me know what you think. Are, are some of my imaginings just too far out there, or do you think some of them are actually possible? Um, I'd love to have a discussion with you guys. Leave some comments, send me an email, whatever. If you guys want to see the sources for this video, remember I can't actually edit them in. So go to my blog and I'll have the list there on the post. Um, thanks for watching everybody. Have re excuse me. Everyone have a great day and we'll be back next time with some discussion about Homo antecessor and Homo heidelbergensis. See you next time.